Nice to be here. Uh, nice to see some, uh, some old friends that I haven't seen in a while. Um, <clears throat> So as, as Bob mentioned, I have a long-standing interest in energy, which really started as an undergraduate when I was at Cornell, where I majored in biology and ecology and got interested in the energetics of ecosystems and then sort of shifted some of those same basic principles of energy materials accounting that ecologists and physical scientists use to understand the natural world and uh, apply them to uh, studying the, the economic, uh, human society, particularly economics. And, at Cornell with Charlie Hall and then Bob at LSU and uh, at Illinois with Bob Herendine who's with us today, Bruce Hannon and some others. Um, uh, I, I've gone on from there. So I've, I have a sort of a sort of uh, broad view of energy and I, I produce some of these uh, sort of large comprehensive reference works on energy and teach a class uh, at BU uh, where we talk about the social, economic, and environmental, and political, and technological aspects of energy. And one uh, day last year, I had a, a student who said, well, the, how, do I sort, how do I sort this all out? How do I understand? Some people say wind energy is better than nuclear, and we should do this and do that. And how do we know if you could, if you could just have 10 things that I could know about? When I talk to my parents, and they want to know why I'm studying this stuff, if I, I could have 10 principles that uh, you could elucidate on what everybody should know about energy, what would they be? And so I actually, I spent a lot of time thinking about that and eventually uh, committed that uh, to, to, to paper or to, to keyboard. And so what I'd like to present today are my list of 10 things that everyone uh, should know about energy, which will lead to a discussion of uh, a lot of our current energy situation, including many events that were discussed in the presidential campaign and some ideas, some recommendations for what we should do going forward to deal with the uh, interconnected nature of these uh, uh, tough energy and environmental problems that we, uh, that we face. So some of this will be uh, review for some of the, those of you in ecology. Some of them, if you are from physics and engineering, some of them will be uh, some review. If you're from economics, you'll see them. But there'll be something uh, for everyone, I think. And hopefully, uh, the whole will be greater than uh, greater than the sum of the parts. So we'll start by going through the, uh, the principles one by one, and then I'll talk about each of them in detail. So here, here's the list. Basic thermodynamics. Energy can't be uh, created or destroyed or recycled. The sun drives everything, both currently in terms of, of all living systems on the planet, but also past sunlight in the form of fossil fuels, which is, uh, underpins the world as we know it today. Uh, climate. Obviously, the, is about an energy balance of the Earth. Um, evolution or natural selection can be viewed as a strategy that operates on basic uh, energy principles. Uh, energy, human, the major hinge points in the evolution of culture are really energy transitions, whether it's fire, or the Industrial Revolution, the impending transition from oil, all had dramatic social, economic, political, and technological ramifications. Uh, energy and economic well-being go, go hand in hand. We, we see that now. Uh, energy prices, changes in energy prices are a very important macroeconomic force. Uh, changes in energy prices affect unemployment, uh, macroeconomic growth, uh, inflation, uh, labor productivity, you name it. And uh, that's why energy prices, the concern about energy independence, which we'll talk about, uh, are so critical because they go to the core of uh, the quality of life at a macroeconomic level, and uh, energy prices are critically important there. Uh, <clears throat> since time immemorial, struggle over the control of energy, because it is so important to human existence, has generated violent conflict. And what we're seeing now in the Middle East, uh, and undoubtedly will continue to see in the Middle East in the coming decades as oil resources dwindle, is nothing new uh, in human history. It's just on a much uh, grander and more, pot more potent uh, scale. Um, <clears throat> a lot of environmental change at every uh, spatial scale of analysis is related to some part of the energy supply chain uh, from local deforestation in India to uh, regional acid rain issues uh, in Europe or the Northeast and global climate change are all uh, closely linked to uh, energy use. Uh, something called energy quality which I'm going to talk about uh, in more detail, very significantly amongst energy sources, uh, a, a, a jewel of, 
uh, electricity from a wind turbine is fundamentally different than a joule of energy from lignite coal. Uh, and it's important to understand what drives those differences because a lot of the choices we've made in the past on the adoption of certain energy systems have been based on these set of qualitative aspects of energy. And our future choices are going to be constrained by a, a similar set of attributes of the palette of alternatives that we have before us now. And then I'll finally talk about something called net energy, uh, which is uh, how much energy it takes to uh, get energy as an important, uh, important constraint. So um, we'll go through this list, some more quickly than others, because uh, I want to spend more time on some of the social and environmental aspects. Um, thermodynamics, uh, the, the uh, development of the field of thermodynamics uh, uh, in engineering and physics in the 19th century really transformed the way in which we understand uh, the world around us. Uh, scientists such as uh, Rudy uh, Clausius and, and the French engineer Sadie Carnot who uh, developed these laws, um, energy is conserved. The second law which imposes limits on the efficiency with which we can convert energy into use work really underpinned modern science and engineering itself. And at, at a very rudimentary, oftentimes invisible level, set broad but immutable constraints on human economic and technological uh, aspirations. Just one example, uh, here's for example the implication of the second law that no energy conversion process can be 100% efficient in terms of uh, burning motor gasoline in uh, uh, an a car which goes through a series of energy conversions, each of which uh, the second law tells us is less than 100% efficient uh, with a lot of, most of the energy being ultimately degraded into waste heat. And so with a certain input of energy uh, at the end, what is actually uh, transformed into motive power is a small fraction of, of the energy input. And so this is one of the most fundamental physical laws uh, uh, on, uh, in the world. And it, of course, explains a lot about the natural world. You've all taken ecology and understand the basic uh, ideas behind uh, food chains and trophic dynamics and uh, fear food pyramids look the way they do and food pyramids never have th more than four or five levels uh, because of the second law of thermodynamics. And you can even explain differences between why uh, a, a, a uh, food chain dominated by ectotherms is shaped differently uh, and narrows more slowly than a food pyramid dominated by endotherms. Again, it all comes back to, uh, to thermodynamics. <clears throat> These basic physical laws also underlie the very way in which we uh, visualize and uh, design systems of energy accounting. So here are the flows of energy through the U.S. economy in 2002 wouldn't look horribly different uh, today. The relative, the different colors are different sources of energy. Oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, solar, wind, geothermal, biomass, hydro. The relative width are indicative of relative quantities to the economy. And uh, one of the reasons I show this is to uh, illustrate how much of the energy up here in the gray area, is the primary input is, gener is lost as waste heat in electricity generation to produce, uh, to produce electricity. Uh, that energy is distributed amongst residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation sectors where it does useful work, moving people and goods, home heating, and so on. But again, this is all based on the f uh, first law energy accounting where the amount of energy that goes in has to somewhere come out as useful work or, or waste heat. You with me? You're with me. Number two, solar energy. I don't have, it, being at the Rubenstein School, I don't have to, and the Gun Institute, I don't have to talk about the importance of solar energy. It is the basis of most life on the planet, except for those chemotrophs, um, producing food for the basis of food, chain, uh, food chains uh, and human uh, food consumption. It also drives all the major material cycles uh, on the planet, uh, not the least of which is uh, uh, solar energy where on the order of 20% of the solar radiation intercepted by the Earth is simply used to lift water uh, from the oceans and other water bodies to drive the hydrologic cycle. And the sulfur and carbon and other major cycles are similarly driven by, by solar energy. Past solar energy is also very important because it uh, produced 
plants uh, and other organisms that uh, lived hundreds of millions of years ago died and were trapped in a very uh, peculiar, you know, from a geological perspective, uh, conditions and were converted ultimately into uh, coal in this case or in the case of marine phytoplankton, at least some diatoms here, uh, into oil and natural gas. So uh, this massive amount of carbon that's stored in the Earth's crust in the form of fossil fuels is also the product of past, uh, past primary production. Climate change obviously is uh, a principal concern now and the, uh, the, the maintenance of the Earth's temperature at about 59 degrees Fahrenheit, which makes life as we know uh, uh, possible, is due to the energy balance of the atmosphere and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which reflect, uh, absorb energy in the long wave radiation. So the balance of these various flows is all really about basic principles of energy transfer. Uh, which, which uh, illustrate the importance of, of energy and climate. We'll come back and talk about climate change a, a bit more. Principle four has to do with, with evolution. That's an image of uh, Alfred Lotka, who was a biologist who uh, first uh, talked about evolution and natural selection uh, as being driven by energy. So if you think of, uh, you can think of uh, all organisms have uh, different energy capturing strategies that are reflected in their behaviors and ultimately in their, 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 their genetic code. And evolution or natural selection from this perspective is really just a, a struggle to see which energy capturing uh, strategy is more effective and more efficient in some uh, way than competing strategies. And those organisms which, dev which more effectively and efficiently convert energy into to useful work, whatever that may be, uh, other things called constant will have the potential to outcompete organisms who have less effective uh, energy capture uh, strategies. And so you can think of uh, an, any living organism uh, that has to capture energy from the environment and allocate it amongst all these different life sustaining tasks. And so there's lots of different ways to do this. Right? You, the amazing diversity we see in the world of life are, in fact, different strategies, in part reflected by different ways of, of doing this, endothermy versus ectothermy, uh, 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 R versus K-selected species, are all really different behaviors that reflect how organisms allocate energy in different ways. And one of the most important ones is the need to capture energy. Right? You, because of the laws of thermodynamics, organisms burn up their available energy stores, have to capture new ones. And so the, the ratio of how much energy you capture to how much you use to capture it is this energy return on investment, which as we'll see when we come back to principle 10 is also a fundamental aspect or attribute of human energy sources as well. And so, as I, I mentioned before, this idea of, of energy, of natural selection and evolution explains why we see ectothermy and endothermy and why, uh, in, in large part, why ectotherms are relegated to parts of the world where levels of primary production are relatively low because where energy is abundant, the, f the, more, the, the faster rate at which endotherms can burn fuel gives them a competitive advantage over ectotherms. Similarly, why do... Uh, Aerobic organisms dominate the world, and anaerobes are relegated to pond muck and a few other places where uh, oxygen levels are low. And the principal reason is that uh, it's an energy, ener energetic one that the aerobic pathway per unit of energy input generates a lot more energy output and offers a, a competitive advantage in that sense. Uh, moving on to, to society, this is an image of um, Prometheus. Um, Prometheus, uh, if you've had any uh, Greek mythology, was uh, in Greek mythology was someone who uh, defied the will of Zeus, and Zeus defied the so he was uh, defied the will of Zeus, and Zeus changed him to the top of some mountain, and every day uh, a bird of prey would come out and peck out of the lobe of his liver, and every night it would grow back, and the eagle would come back every night for you know a gazillion years or something like that. Well, what Prometheus did to so tick Zeus off was he gave humans fire. Zeus, you know, if you recall, wanted to keep humans under his thumb, right, under his control. And Zeus knew that fire was an amazingly powerful and liberating uh, technology. 
as it were. And uh, it's, it's, it's powerful because when Prometheus gave humans fire, it enabled us not only to, to provide warmth and to cook food and provide clothing, but more importantly, to smelt metals, make bricks, and otherwise transform other material resources into goods and services. And so that's why the Greeks in their mythology, that fire was such a transformative technology that they attribute it not to a human, but to a god. And so one of the questions that we face now is that it, the second Promethean technology was probably the steam engine, which then enabled us to convert fossil fuels into work, which far transformed the impacts that, that fire had. What's the next Promethean technology after oil and fossil fuels? What is, is there another technology out there will, that has Promethean-like attributes that will allow us to not only maintain our, our high standards of living that fossil fuels have produced in the industrial world and also raise three or four billion people out of poverty in the developing world in the uh, century to come. Here's the uh, major transitions that occurred uh, in the United States. If you, if you did this for the world, it would look pretty much the same, only, only uh, displaced by a few decades in time. The vertical axis indicates the percentage of all the energy used in the economy that comes from a particular source. And so you can see in 1800, we were still largely in a, an agrarian economy, uh, early industrializing economy, where the principal inputs were wood for heating and cooking and early industry and animal feed, because horses and humans were the sole, pretty much the sole prime movers in society. Most of the work was done by human labor and draft animals. And uh, what happened during the Industrial Revolution was really the, a substitution of inanimate energy, fossil fuels, for animate energy, humans and draft animals. And you see that cycle of substitution taking place between 1800 and about World War I, when by, by World War I, coal was now supplying three quarters of our energy use. And that is really the Industrial Revolution was the substitution of relatively efficient energy converters. Human can generate about one-tenth of a horsepower. Uh, a, a horse can generate, well, about a horsepower. And uh, which in and of itself is, uh, shows you why the development of horses and animal husbandry was, was life transforming. Because a horse is eight to ten times more powerful than a human. So when humans learned animal husbandry, and now instead of tilling a, a hectare of, of land by hand, you now had a horse, you're 10 times more productive as a person. And then when this, the water wheel and windmill and then the steam engine came along, which have much higher horsepowers, and then eventually gas turbines and other types of engines that have thousands and thousands of, of horsepower, what was economically possible dwarfed what was possible with these lower quality energy sources and energy converters. Then there was a second sub major cycle of substitution uh, when coal declined uh, through the 1960s and oil and gas increased, such that by the 1960s, oil and gas were now supplying upwards of 70% of our energy use. This uh, magenta line down here is electricity. This is not electricity that comes from a thermal power plant. That is, it's not electricity in a plant that burns coal or oil. Okay, because that would double count on a graph like this. This is energy from so-called primary sources, which are hydro, nuclear, wind, solar, geothermal. So here, the small contribution uh, of primary electricity is, is hydropower, and then it jumps up here in the 70s when nuclear power plants started to, to come online. What's interesting here is that if you think of renewable, if you take hydro out of the picture, which is a renewable form of energy, but renewable energy is nowhere to be seen. In fact, you can't even plot it because the width of the line would overstate its contribution to our current energy situation. Which, when you think about, if you're going to get serious about climate change, if you're going to get serious about using less uh, oil, uh, things have to change re really dramatically and very quickly. And it would be difficult to overstate uh, the rapidity with which we have to force or engineer the next transition if we really want to get serious about climate change. Because these transitions were not engineered. I mean, there was a lot of, it was a combination of both purposeful invention, but a lot of, of happenstance, uh, technological and economic and social imperatives that made this all happen, right? The eradication of smallpox was a directed imperative. 
a major transition, the Green Revolution, was an engineered transition. These energy transitions were not. And so one of, the f one of the characteristics of our next energy transition is that it probably needs to be engineered in the sense that we are going to need to direct by policy or by manipulation of the market where we want the energy system to go. Principle six, energy and economic growth uh, go hand in hand. This is a graph of uh, for all the nations in the world for which we have uh, uh, reliable data, the amount of energy use along this axis and the total uh, output of GDP along this axis. So these are total quantities, not per capita. And what you see is a couple of things jump out here. One is that, in general, uh, as the economy gets bigger, energy use goes up. And uh, the biggest economies in the world use the most energy in total. Now, if you adjust this by per capita, things change a bit. But um, the basic idea here is that so we have all these poor nations down here that want to get richer. And one of the implications of, of this development trajectory is that there's a lot of built-in momentum behind uh, future increases in energy use so that are going to have to come from somewhere, even if we hopefully use it much more efficiently than, than we did in, in our development. It certainly is not a, a, a there are certainly a significant differences and potential for improvements in energy efficiency. That is, if you look at the Russian Federation and Switzerland, both have about exactly the same size economy in terms of total production of, of GDP, but the Swiss use energy, a lot less energy, to produce the same amount of GDP. Why is that? Bob, you, you can't answer, Mr. Herndon. Hmm? Yeah? They're more efficient, but yeah, well, the data tell us they're more efficient, but my question is why are they more efficient? They're smaller? They sh they're short? <laughs> smaller land area. Actually, geographic size does have something to do with it because if you're more spread out, on average, transporting a good or a person uh, place to place will on average be greater in Russia or Canada or the U.S. for that matter than, than other places. So that's, that's one reason. The structure of the economies, which is related to that, is important. I mean, Switzerland, you know, they produce chocolate and cuckoo clocks and banking services. And Russia has a lot of basic blue smokestack manufacturing industry, which are more energy intensive than financial services. So that basic structure is, uh, is important. And policies are also important. Sweden's, Switzerland's more affluent. Uh, they tend to demand and receive a higher level of environmental quality from the government in terms of policies and so on. Russia uh, it, it, it does not have the same type of, of demand for and supply of environmental quality. So, there, are, there is, even though there's this important relationship, there's lots of room for improvement based on uh, uh, these differences, both within and among countries. Yes, you in the front row. <laughs> so it looks like there's, there's sort of a production frontier here. You know, the upper limit is, is a fairly straight line. Is that, is that saying that those economies have, have, have gotten most of the efficiency, efficiency improvements out, and it's the, the other ones that could move up to that line not necessarily go far beyond? So these folks could move up this way, yeah, but not, not past this. Uh, so the, you're putting the U.S. on that frontier? Just, just from looking at the graph. It's yeah. Like, you know, it's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that. It's possible. There are limits, there are limits to efficiency improvement. So where are those limits? Is that, is that frontier? Is there a frontier that you could, you could plot? It seems to me, the answer is yes, but it seems to me that that really has to be specified on an, almost on a device by device level or, or service by service, you know, tra uh, personal, you know, transportation or lighting and so on. Whether or not you could, at the whole economy, it would seem to be tougher to define. But it, it would be interesting uh, to do a more, kind of a more complete in-depth analysis of that because there is sort of a, a limit up here. I don't know who this person is, but um, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, related to this energy, uh, the re relationship between energy and uh, the economy, uh, the amount of energy use uh, is important. Energy prices are also important, as I mentioned, and as you all uh, know. Uh, this is a graph of uh, crude oil prices and constant $2,000 per barrel through the end of 2007. Of 
course, in 2008, we've seen new frontiers uh, being uh, breached here. But <clears throat> it does indicate a number of things about how important energy is. In the, the 50s and 60s, which is, one of the, which is when the, the U.S. and global economies really exploded in terms of, of economic growth, that was underlain by declining real energy prices largely because of regulation by Texas and state and uh, Texas, Louisiana and other state regulatory agencies which uh, put f uh, controls on, on oil prices. So energy was actually getting cheaper right up and through October of 1973, the Yom Kippur War in Israel uh, when uh, the Arab oil embargo was uh, instituted and oil prices shot up. And so you can imagine if you look at this graph what a shock this is to the system when you've been weaned on this and then this happens. And indeed, significant, just as we're seeing now, significant recession, unemployment, so on and so forth. Uh, things recover, uh, and then there's a, another massive increase in oil prices in 1980-81 due to uh, the overthrow of the Shah in Iran, the taking of the hostages in Iran, the nationalization of the Iranian oil industry. They kicked the, the international oil companies uh, out and at the same time a reduction in output by the Saudis and a couple of other uh, OPEC members. Oil prices shoot up and uh, really put the whole world into the tank pretty much like it is now. And in some ways, uh, although we, the current recession is yet to play out, this recession was the worst since the Great Depression. It was the only time in U.S. history where we had double digit inflation and unemployment at the same time. That was bad. Uh, buried Jimmy Carter's presidency. I tell my freshmen, okay, this year was the most depressing I've ever had as a faculty member when freshmen had birth dates in the 1990s. That was, it was like, okay. Because now all, my, all the stories I tell each year get a little more out of date. Um, but 1979, okay, a president of the United States comes on national TV, prime time, for 48 minutes, talks about nothing but energy. Right? Nothing but energy, right here. Somewhere in here, not 79. And he talked about, hey, he said, look, we have a problem. We have to use less energy. We have to conserve. Oh, my God. Decapitated him politically. Absolutely decapitated him. And that's, like, that's why no president since him, Democrat or Republican, has been found a way to engage the American public about the way they use energy. We started to see it a little bit in this cam campaign, but it was still mostly about supply. How do we build more power plants or drill offshore or so on and so forth. So... But anyways, then prices collapse in 85 and 86 due to a change in, uh, due to decrease in demand by the recession and the Saudis changed, uh, OPEC changed the way in which they priced energy due to the, the Saudis uh, essentially flooding the market with oil in 85 and 86 to intentionally cause a collapse and things have bounced around. Here's this big run up uh, in 2007 which continued to 2008 and now the bottom is falling out again in part because we're the world oil demand, U.S. motor gasoline consumption this week is 11% lower than it was a year ago. That's a huge drop, huge drop. So as the whole engine of the economy slows down, so does the demand for energy, uh, and so too then does the price of oil. So recessions are good for low energy prices, but that's obviously not the way in which you want to, uh, the way in which you want to do it. <clears throat> There's also other ways to look at the connection between energy and well-being. Now turning to the developing world, uh, this is data from the International uh, Energy Agency which shows in this, uh, uh, the yellow circles, the, the people measured in millions who have no electricity. So half a billion people in Africa, uh, over a billion in Asia. The gray circles are the, the uh, number of people measured in millions of people who use traditional biomass, which includes wood and also uh, animal dung. And so this is a whole different sort of aspect of the energy challenge of, of getting people off of biomass and animal dung for a variety of human health, environmental, and economic reasons onto more modern energy supplies, particularly electricity, in places where poverty is, is rampant. And uh, this is a, a huge challenge uh, that we face because that energy is going to have to come from, from somewhere and we need to do it in a way that's not going to dump lots more carbon uh, in the atmosphere. So many women in the world, this is what they spend their day doing, food and water spends much of the day, this wood simply for the, today's and a few days uh, uh, cooking and uh, it has a lot of uh, important, as we'll see, human health uh, issues. 
Uh, conflict, this is uh, a really important area which is growing importance as the demand for energy uh, grows and where the sources of remaining fossil fuels become concentrated uh, in the case of oil in the Middle East, in the case of gas in the Middle East, and also Central Asia. And so these hot spots uh, of conflict will uh, continue to be uh, hot into the future. But it's nothing, uh, nothing new. We've always been uh, uh, fighting over energy in some way, shape, or form. Most wars in history had something to do with land. Well, for, before fossil fuels, land was energy. It was biomass, and it was food for the animals that did the work. And so uh, whether it's timber or hydropower or coal or oil and gas, one that I like to t talk about in New England, which most people don't think of as an energy problem. Did you have a question? No. Just um, has to do with uh, the American Revolution. And so <clears throat> the British, as we know, rose to world dominance with a sailing ship. And the sailing ship was an amazing energy revolution in terms of being able to move people and goods uh, farther than your, your little local region. Before then, how did people get around on the water? You had to row. Well, that's horribly inefficient because humans are bad energy converters, and a significant fraction of the ship was simply taken up by the people doing the rowing and the food needed to feed them. And you didn't have a whole lot of room left over to carry goods. And that's why you were really limited, if you looked at the Roman Empire, who really used it the most, the geographic extent of that influence was quite small. Now, all of a sudden, when you learned how to use sailing ships and you had wind energy, the fuel is free. Of course, you're limited by where it blows, but tremendous change in the energy dynamic uh, of the system. So anyways, so your, uh, Britain rises to power. They quickly mow down all the f trees in, your, in Great Britain. I mean every tree that could be possibly made into a spar, the, the piece of wood that they make mass out of, which they call spars. M much of continental Europe, so they, were qu they then uh, were going up uh, uh, through uh, the little narrow strait. What's the little narrow strait between Copenhagen and, uh, and Sweden? Or, uh, not co um. <laughs> right there. So, the UK, Britain was now going up and through here and up into the Baltic to Scandinavia now to get their trees. And in one of those, there was a series of wars in like 50 or 100 years, right, between the Danes and uh, England. And so one, one time the Danes blockaded that pass. And all of a sudden England had no, they panicked. They had no timber for uh, their ships. So they turned to the colonies. And uh, they started to come into New England Oh, here's my little map. So here's the little place where they were going, and they, got, they blockaded here, and they were cut off from their timber supply. So they turned to New England, and you have these amazing white uh, pine trees. This is one in, uh, somewhere in New Hampshire, which were great spar timber. And so the crowns quickly came over and started. T they passed a law that said, every tree over two feet in diameter, we own. And they went through and put this, uh, the symbol of the Royal Navy, this broad arrow, on all these trees and said you can't cut them down. There were severe penalties uh, for doing so. And the colonists were like, well, wait a minute. We need them. We're building ships. We're bu building factories, homes. We need this timber. And this was a major bone of contention leading up to the American Revolution. And in fact, if you look at uh, this, one of the most famous paintings done by a U.S. artist, whose name I actually forget, but the Battle of Bunker Hill, if you look at the colonists, their flag, the colonist flag had the white pine tree in the, up, in the, in the corner. This shows you how important this struggle over uh, this important resource was uh, to, to the colonists. And it was uh, a scarcity-driven uh, energy conflict. Fast forward uh, to oil. Oil has, since we started using it, has always been a source uh, of conflict. World War I was still a, a war with uh, old and new technology. There was still the horse-driven uh, cavalry, but also some new mechanized equipment as well. And uh, uh, Baku, Baku in what is now Azerbaijan, which is really where the world oil industry started, even before it started in the U.S., was uh, a, a battleground. Uh, even then, fast forward to World War II, oil is now central to a successful uh, wartime effort. Um, actually, Japan, one of the, the, the uh, decisions of Japan to do what they did was the fact that they were starved for oil because we were actually exporting a lot of oil to Japan. That's where they're getting most of their oil. And then we, uh, when they joined up with the Nazis, we shut off our oil 
exports to Japan, they uh, invaded uh, Indonesia and other places in that part of the world that had a lot of oil and uh, caused a lot of uh, conflict there. A lot of, the, of Hitler's particularly last days were trying to get access to the uh, oil. They were running short on oil after they had gotten cut off in North Africa. And uh, they were trying to get, the war ended with them trying to get control of, of uh, Russian oil fields. Um, conflict, uh, U.S. and, and uh, Britain orchestrated an overthrow of uh, Prime Minister uh, Mossadegh of Iran in 1953 because he wasn't friendly to international oil companies. And this was not even a, they didn't even try to hide this. This was just the U.S. and Britain saying, that's it, you're out, we're coming in, pack your stuff, and uh, we're changing governments because uh, of oil. We know, in 1991, Gulf War erupts after Iraq invades uh, Kuwait and seizes control of its uh, oil fields and uh, in other parts of the world. A lot of horrible things happen in Nigeria now, the Niger Delta uh, oil rich area where Shell and other national oil companies uh, have operations and the flow of money from that is, let's just say it doesn't trickle down and there's lots of ethnic disputes over who should get what oil and, and it's a horrible, horrible mess. So um, and we, we certainly probably haven't seen the last of that. Um, energy, and the impact on, on environment and human health, you've all seen this before. This is uh, IPCC work showing the increase of about eight tenths of a degree centigrade in temperature, uh, global mean surface warning during this period, this forecast based on various scenarios of what uh, climate might do uh, in the future which we now know is directly attributable to, some of it is directly attributable to the increase in carbon dioxide uh, in the atmosphere indicated here in the Mauna Loa or, or Keeling curve, which shows the increase in carbon dioxide concentration uh, in the northern hemisphere uh, over, this, over this period of time. And so energy is clearly the most important source of CO2 and, and some of the other greenhouse gases. So the climate issue and the energy issue are really a uh, hand in glove type of uh, of issue that needs to be dealt with. Human health, this is a major issue. We talked about uh, indoor, uh, the, the use of traditional fuels. Uh, the uh, death and uh, mortality and morbidity from the inhalation of indoor air pollution is one of the leading causes of death in the world. It's, it's like up there in the top 10 because a lot of women and children spend their day doing this and in inhaling uh, pollutants. Uh, that are uh, very harmful, particularly if you're bur burning animal dung as a fuel. And so uh, energy and human health go hand in hand uh, in, the, in the developing world. Um, so uh, energy quality. So this is an, a, an important but one of the less uh, intuitively obvious uh, aspects of energy uh, that I spend a lot of time uh, with my students trying to explain and to understand myself because I don't, I don't firmly firmly grasp it, but to me, I don't think of energy quality in terms of physical or thermodynamic or engineering perspective. We, people use energy to produce a, a service. We use it to move us, to heat a home, to illuminate a keyboard, something in the economic or social, social realm. So I think of energy quality in, this, in, in terms of this, from a macroeconomic perspective. How much GDP do I get from using one heat unit of energy? Okay? And the key here is that different energy sources, different joules of different energy sources generate different amounts of GDP. Just like different, like labor productivity varies, right? People, different people produce more iPods per hour than others or more cars per hour because of a variety of differences, education, health care, native intelligence, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, different forms of capital are more productive, right? We all know that. And energy is the same way. It's no different. And uh, unfortunately, we use uh, heat units to add up coal and oil and gas and electricity because it helps us obey the first law, the conservation of energy, and also because it's easy. But in doing so, it really glosses over that you're adding, really adding up apples and oranges and implies a level of substitutability amongst jewels across types that doesn't exist. So what determines energy equality? A lot of different attributes. Density, safety, how easy can you store it? Uh, ease of transport, it's pollution intensity, carbon intensity, intermittency, <coughs> important in the case of wind and solar, spatial distribution, 
uh, also important in the case of renewables. So all of these, these and other attributes of energy work together to define this, what I'm calling energy quality. And I'll just show you a couple of attributes that I think are particularly important. And one has to do with, with density. This measures two aspects of energy density. One is what the, the mass or gravimetric density of an energy source. So this is the number of joules per kilogram of fuel. So if you had a, a kilogram of coal or a kilogram of gas or a kilogram of oil, how much heat is in that? And this is a measure of volumetric density. So if you took a, a liter of the fuel, how much energy is in it? And so if you look at the position of the liquid fuels, you quickly see why oil is so damned important. It has this amazing combination. Uh, it has a very high volumetric density, but also a pretty high gravimetric density. And so for, among other things, uh, it is a reason why you can take a, a metal container about this big and put it on a, a, a two-ton chunk, chunk of metal and move that you know, 500 miles across the Earth's surface. That's pretty amazing if you think about it thermodynamically, right? a, 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 a car. And it's because of this very high density that liquid fuels have. On the other hand, uh, you look at something like hydrogen. We hear about the hydrogen economy. Uh, hydrogen is this amazing thing which, which at standard temperature and pressure has the, by far the highest gravimetric density, but it has an extremely low volumetric density. So if you want to get hydrogen in a form that are, is useful to us, so you can propel a car with it or, or generate a fuel cell, uh, power in a fuel cell, you need to uh, increase its volumetric density to some reasonable form. And that's enormously expensive to do, even to get it up to 150 bar, much less to liquefy it. So, uh, and also you see, uh, for example, uh, biomass fuels uh, have uh, a fairly low energy density and is one of the principal barriers to biomass, amongst other things. One of the reasons why I'm not particularly enthused about biomass as a fuel. These very low energy densities. Uh, other liquid fuels are, are intermediate. But Notice up here, nuclear energy, which is way off the scale. Uh, the power, the binding energy of, of, of the atom is amazing. And that's why it's such a seductive uh, technology. Uh, the challenge, of course, is to harness that in a way that is uh, politically, environmentally, geopolitically, nuclear proliferation-wise uh, safe. So anyways, one aspect of, uh, of energy. And of course, ethanol. So you're starting down here, and you're, getting, you're, you're trying to get the energy density up to here with ethanol. And this is also a very energy intensive and expensive process, which is why ethanol only exists in the United States because of a government subsidy. It would evaporate instantly uh, without that. Another aspect of quality has, has to do with spatial, distri uh, spatial distribution of energy. This is some work by Karen Jacobson at Stanford, where she and her colleagues mapped, uh, uh, glo uh, produced a global wind energy, wind resource uh, analysis, where they generated estimates of the uh, average velocity of wind at 80 meters off the Earth's surface, which is a, roughly the neighborhood of a, the hub of a modern uh, wind turbine. And uh, these are different wind speed classes, uh, 6 meters per second all the way up to 9 meters per second. And so my point of, of showing this is that uh, there are a lot of good wind energy spots in areas along the coast where a lot of people live. But there's also a lot of major population centers where there's relatively not good wind source. You're not going to build a wind turbine in anything uh, probably between the dark blue and the green. You're not going to build wind turbines in these lower class sites probably, um, lower than three meters per second. So the challenge with wind energy is, of course, is getting it from where it's abundant to where people actually live and need it. Not an insurmountable problem, but it's a, pro it's a challenge and a cost associated with wind energy. The issue of intermittency is also a big one. Um, this shows what are called the load factors for three different power generation, electricity generation uh, products, uh, processes. The load factor means uh, if you build a 1,000 megawatt plant, what fraction of the time is it actually generating 1,000 megawatts? And nuclear power plants in the US are actually the most reliable form of power that we have. They run at about 90% of capacity. 
coal-fired power plants are down around 75 or 80, and wind turbines are, are quite low, obviously because sometimes the wind ain't blowing, so it's not generating power. So if you're going to replace 1,000 megawatts of nuclear plant with wind turbines, you need to install a lot more than 1,000 megawatts simply to guarantee that, uh, that replacement. Again, not an insurmountable problem, not a problem you can't deal with with the capital planning, but it is an extra cost associated with wind, adding wind energy to a grid that's built around these uh, other processes. Okay, my last principle before I get to the solutions, Ida and Bob, uh, <laughs> has to do with, with net energy. And uh, this is some work that, that uh, Bob and I worked on a, a long time ago, and I've kind of gone away from and come back to uh, over the years. And uh, it's important as a, a, a long-run constraint on what is and is not possible in terms of energy. So just like we can think of uh, uh, an energy return on investment for salmon swimming around, fishing, eating, whatever salmon eat, smaller fish probably, right? Um, so the amount of energy they gain relative to how much they burn swimming around can be measured by, their, by the energy return on investment. We can do the same thing for human energy systems. You have a certain amount of energy in the ground, and you have to look for it, extract it, process it, transform it, and get it into a form that it's useful to, to be used in. And all that takes energy. So there's these inputs of energy, not only directly the energy burned by the drilling, but also the energy it takes in Gary, Indiana, to make the steel that goes into building the drilling rig. And if you add up uh, all the uh, energy um, produced to all the energy used, you come up with this energy return on investment. And so one of the, if we go, think of, go back and think about those energy transitions, one other act attribute of those previous energy transitions is that we selectively made transitions from systems that delivered larger and larger energy return on investments. And oil delivers, uh, in its, back when we first discovered it, delivered a far greater energy surplus than coal and, and other resources uh, before it. So here's one example of why uh, this is important. This is um, a, a compilation of some work done by myself and other people. So here's the energy return on investment for different uh, fuel systems. So I'm not talking about power generation uh, here for fuel systems. So for the U.S. in 2000 at the wellhead, okay, at the wellhead, oil delivered about 20 barrels out for every barrel you invested just to get it to the wellhead. And you run it through a refinery, which takes more energy. And so motor gasoline then is about somewhere between 10 and 15 to 1. OK? Gasoline at the tank that you're using. Coal, um, in 2000, at, at the mine mouth, had a much higher energy return on investment, which is about 80 to 1, uh, which probably has dropped some. And so people say that and say, well, gee, I thought you said oil was uh, a better quality resource than coal. But if you actually do this type of analysis and correct for the quality of energy we use to extract oil versus coal, you see that we use a lot of high quality electricity to extract coal, which is a low quality form. So if you do a quality correction, this actually falls back down close to where, where oil is. But it still delivers a high surplus. Ethanol. This red line is the energy break-even point, where the EROI is equal to 1. And ethanol, the, the, the proponents of ethanol uh, have argued recently that the energy return on investment for ethanol, which Bob Herendine and others showed back in the 70s was less than 1, has finally broken the break-even point. And it's now 1.5 to 1. And you, you'd think that they had discovered you know, the holy grail as if this was uh, some kind of miraculous uh, investment. And the, the, uh, I think it's probably difficult to say, given the uncertainties, and I'd be interested to know what Bob has to say about this, whether or not it actually is uh, uh, greater than or equal to 1. But uh, it doesn't really matter, because you're competing with this. And uh, something that's 10 or 15 to 1, and you're replacing it with something that's 1.5 to 1, uh, that's a whole different, you're going to have to devour, devour, dev devote a large fraction of our economic activity from something else to producing corn and ethanol if you're going to run an economy on ethanol. Um, and uh, most of this energy to produce ethanol is embodied in a lot of the inputs, the fertilizers and the herbicides and the pesticides and so on um, to produce the corn. Ethanol uh, from sugarcane in Brazil looks better uh, than corn-based uh, ethanol because 
It's a higher starch uh, feedstock to begin with, less fossil fuel used in Brazil, and so on. So, uh, but anyways, uh, not, ev not even close. And that's why without this subsidy that the farmers get, this wouldn't survive in the market, ultimately. Oil shale and coal liquefaction, uh, converting coal to liquid fuels, which we know how to do. The Germans did this in World War II. Uh, we know how to do it. It also has a very low energy return on investment, although we haven't done any of this really since the 1970s. So if we build a new plant today, I'm not sure what it would, what it would look like. Um, but it's certainly lower, uh, lower than this. So fossil fuels, the, the challenge here as we move forward is to replace fuels that have this type of return with something approaching it or pay a significant cost in economic and in environmental terms uh, for, uh, for doing this. Much lower. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Yes? Well, corn is renewable. Right, right. Unless you grow it with oil. Let's say solar. And well, that's power. That's power generation. These are fuels. Okay. We have looked at that, and, and wind turbines do have an energy return in good locations that is very good relative to coal, baseload coal, and certainly nuclear plants. So the photovoltaics, not yet. They're not ready for prime time. They have to drop in cost by at least an order of magnitude more before they're even close to baseload power generation. Remote applications of solar, building integrated stuff, that's different. But I'm talking about baseload power generation. So wind looks good uh, of the renewables. Geothermal is great where you can get it, but, I mean, it's pretty geographically uh, isolated. I don't have the power numbers with me. So let's now t move to what all, what this means uh, or Actually, it's, what I'm about to say doesn't draw, follow directly from anything I just said. These are my ideas on if we were to do something substantive uh, on energy and climate. If I were energy czar for a day, which probably would not be good for the country, um, what, would, uh, what would we do? The first thing we have to do is manage the transition from oil. Okay. You've all heard of the debate about peak oil, and some people think oil peaked last Thursday at 3 o'clock, or it's going to peak next Tuesday at 4, or 50 years from now. And uh, I don't think it's that important. It is important, but uh, the, the problem is the uncertainty associated about when the peak is. These new energy sources, whether it's wind or nuclear, are going to come from investment by the private sector, largely, in the U.S., and also around the world to, to a lesser degree. And so what I, what, the question for me is, how well is the market, the private sector, how are they going to manage and deal with that uncertainty in terms of investing in wind or ethanol or nuclear, whatever it's going to be? So here's uh, world oil production. This is some work by Robert Kaufman and Daniel you know, Shires uh, at, at BU. So here's a historic world oil production through 2005 or 2006. Okay? So through 2004, we've produced about one trillion barrels of, of oil, okay? The estimates out there, that very draconian low range, which will probably be exceeded, and the optimistic high range, which we'll probably never get to, are another one to three trillion barrels to be discovered in the future. And so if you run these, if you simply fit a, a simple uh, curve, uh, to these different quantities, if it's only another one trillion, oil production peaks in 2013 and does that. If it's an additional three trillion, it's 2032. So what's interesting to me, one of the things is how, what relatively little difference, a threefold difference in your assessment of undiscovered oil makes, um, simply because we've already produced a lot, of, a lot of the world's oil. So the question, though, is given this uncertainty, we don't know where it's going to be, how well uh, do we guess the transition? Here's the, here's the challenge. If we assume that, so thus far, so we look at uh, barrels per day of oil at the time. So, so far, world oil production has kind of gone like this, and demand for world oil has more or less gone hand in hand. Well, we have some changes in stocks and so on, but we basically consume what we produce. And so the, the, the challenge is that once world oil production does this, we know that consumption is going to want to keep doing this, right? And so we, we don't want a gap because that will push prices 
through the roof. So we need to come up with a, a substitute that will, will match demand into the future. And that's a, that's a tricky business in terms of trying to guess that. And so my, here, here's my guesstimation is that I don't think the market's going to do it. Because if, think about if you're a private invest, you're investing in ethanol or some substitute for oil, and you're looking at this and saying, well, do I invest in capacity such that my substitute comes online before the peak or after the peak? Which mistake would you rather make if you were a private investor? You want to come in after. You don't want to come in before when there's no demand for your product. Right? So you're going to, make, you're going to err on coming in after the peak. If you're a consumer, which mistake would you rather make? You want it before. And so I, I think this, this calls for a, a perspective, when I say managing the transition, some way for enlightened policy, and I realize that's oxymoronic to most, to deal with this uncertainty and draw, uh, put bounds on the path of, develop, of investment to make sure that this gap doesn't uh, appear. Yeah. Well, you could do that, but you're never you're not going to you're not going to do this to demand. Because you saw that you can't argue for a one to one relationship between energy and GDP and then say you're going to do that to demand. Well, I think GDP will continue to grow. I'm assuming that it will continue to grow at least for the next couple of decades when this is going to happen. Why assume that? Because I think that's what's going to happen. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I, how is it not going to happen? Well, the one, one thing is that um, I mean, even that 2013 looks a lot optimistic and that that doesn't seem to be accounting for the uh, decreased energy return on investment. That's gross, not net, right. right. Yeah, and which uh, will peel, peel a few years off of that. And there, so some people believe it will peel about, uh, you know, five years off of that, and meaning we're plateauing right now. Mm -hmm. And without the energy, how do we keep growing? True, but we've been, we've, we've, we've been on the downside of that energy return for 20 years, and we're still managed to grow. What's the change in energy production from 2005 to now? We're at an all-time high this month for world oil production. Right. Yeah. So much for Colin Campbell and the yeah. doomsayers. We hit a, a world record high. Another issue, uh, uh, that I think that when you deal with is what I call tra transparent and understandable cost-benefit analysis. It, it is extremely difficult for me, as someone who studies the industry, to talk to people about whether wind energy costs more than nuclear power or less. And the answer is, I don't really know. Because there are lots of aspects to costs and, and benefits that are hard to monetize. Here's what, what we do know. This is information from the Energy Information Administration that they use to produce their forecast. This is what, if we were to start building new power plants right now, and they were to come online in about 2016, what the cost of electricity per, per unit of, of electricity would be. Okay, this is levelized cost. Levelized cost is you take the cost of building the plant, operating it, decommissioning it over its lifetime, take the present value of that all the way back to the future in present value terms and divide it by all the energy that it produces. Now here's the, here's the problem though, is that you have uh, tremendous subsidies and externalities which distort this. Every energy source up here is subsidized. No wind energy in the world would be put up at the rate it is, including Denmark, Spain, Germany, the U.S., without subsidies. It's feed-in tariffs in Europe and the production tax credit in the U.S. Right? And the Cape Wind Farm in Massachusetts, which they're trying to build, uh, in our backyard, the first offshore wind farm, the guy who's building it came and gave a talk with this great spiel about how great it was. And I said, well, if it weren't for the, the three cents a kilowatt hour check you're going to get from the federal government, you, would you be doing this? He goes, well, of course not. So every energy source is subsidized. They all have externalities. Nuclear energy certainly has been subsidized the most historically and continues to have large subsidies, uh, which makes a lot of people say, well, we really can't rely on this because of these subsidies. Uh, but it's, it's a very tricky question. And when you add the externalities, the pollution and so on, uh, things get even trickier. So here's uh, the subsidy issue. In 2006, this is some work by Doug Coppola at EarthTrack, where the, most, where the subsidies were, g were given in the U.S., majority to oil and gas, largely through the tax code. Uh, coal, nuclear, ethanol gets a whopping portion, 
and other renewables, including wind, which are, are in there, get a relatively small portion. So the next thing I would do is, is tax carbon. And this, uh, I think, is a, is a critical thing to do for two reasons. One,